scene called Boldacity. Um, Boldacity. What is boldacity? When boldness meets audacity. What do you have when you have the combination of a holy boldness mixed with an audacious faith? There you have boldacity. Uh, faith and boldness living at the intersection of where they come together and it will embolden a city. Bodacity lives at the corner of boldness and audacious faith. At that intersection, bodacity, when we experience bodacity, we will bold a city. And that's what we're praying that God will allow us to do. Now last week, I... Um, really tried to paint a picture of how audacious it really is to think that we, we pray and talk to God. What an amazing thing that is that we probably just take that for granted, honestly. We take it for granted all the time. But just stop for a moment and think about it. The God who spoke the entire universe into existence, that we get to talk with Him like this morning, that we get to have face-to-face -face with Him. Who are we to think that we could ever have that? How audacious, how, how bold is that? Um, to, to think that we can speak and He will listen. To think that, that He would actually entertain conversation with us. But here's the thing about it. It really, it really is true that that's what God does. He does do that. He listens to us when we talk to Him. He hears us when we pray. And not only does He tolerate us, not only does He put up with us, but quite opposite, He actually enjoys us. And He invites us to relationship. How amazing is that? So, boldacity. And so I encouraged you last week to have the boldacity to take off the mask, to let the glory of God just shine out in everything you do. Now today's talk is titled, The Boldacity to Speak the Truth. Amen. Um, the Boldacity to Speak the Truth. I, I want to talk to you about speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. And by the way, that's a phrase that's right out of the Bible. Right? You recognize that. That Paul instructed us that we should speak the truth in love. And uh, in fact, I want to read it for you. Ephesians chapter 4 will be on your screen right now. Then we will no longer be infants. Tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people, people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head. That is Christ. Uh, from Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does the work. Now, of course, this verse, Ephesians 4, this is talking about when believers um, speak the truth in love to one another. It's talking about church families sort of holding one another accountable. But I want you to have the bodacity to speak the truth in love to people that you care about, to, to your friends, to your co-workers, to your loved ones. To speak the truth of, of God in love to your lost friends and co-workers and family and loved ones. I promised you last week that today I would give you the exact conversation that you need to have with your lost loved ones, with your lost friends, with your lost families. And by God's grace I plan to do that. But let me tell you something. 
It's incredibly important that we have the courage to redefine Jesus' love for our culture right now. Here's what I mean by that. You know, we've been seeking, singing today about the love of God. I just immediately, as the song started, I knew, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. God is chasing me down. He loves me. Aren't you glad that God initiated love to us that is undeserved? I mean, we can't earn it. We can't do anything to get it as a reward. We don't deserve it. He just, He loves us. And, and that love is amazing. But we need to redefine for our culture Jesus' love not as a soft, gushy, warm-hearted, fuzzy feeling. It's more than that. Jesus' love demands more than that. Um, that's how some people view Jesus. They sort of see Him uh, like a hippie type that's so easygoing and just wants everybody to be happy and for all of us to just experience peace and love. You know, man, God just loves you. Love, love, love. And everybody should feel that. We have been, I think, as the church of Jesus Christ, so quick to say God loves you. Uh, the message that Jesus loves everyone, that we've made it unintentionally this warm, gushy, feel-good statement that makes people feel happy. But that's not an accurate reflection of the clear teaching of the Bible. Note with me how many times the Bible, when it speaks of God's love, connects it intentionally with the death of Jesus on the cross. God loves us, and He showed us this love by His Son had to die. Let that sink in. The cost of this great love. Let me show you what I mean. Here's John chapter 3, verse 16. We all know it, for God so loved the world. That what? That He gave His one and only Son. Amen. Uh, we love that. That's one of my favorite verses. Is it one of yours? I mean, all of us should have that memorized. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, very important. God didn't send His, world to the, uh, send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that He might save the world through Him. So there is this connection. God loves you. How does God show His love? He sent His Son to die. You think that's the only place? 1 John 4. Look at verse 10. This is love. Okay, so he's going to define love for us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love from God is defined as he loved us so much that he sacrificed his own son. Love meant Jesus being sacrificed on a cross. Watch this, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. He's going to demonstrate love for us. Here's love, He says. Let me demonstrate it for you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Brother, that's love. I didn't do anything yet. I wasn't a polished, clean, clean Christian. I wasn't a squeaky, clean Christian. I was just a mess. My life was just a hot mess. I was just away from God, just in my sin, lost, and God loved me anyway and gave His Son as a sacrifice. It cost Him everything so that He could purchase this relationship. Do you see that love means Christ Death. That's the real truth about love. Now, I'm going to give you an example of, of what I mean when I talk about our current culture and the way there is a misconception about how Jesus is all love. And um, I'm going to show you in a, a few moments a video 
uh, by Heather uh, McDonald. Uh, she's a comedian who is known for her irreverent humor. She uh, very often uses off-color, raunchy humor. And um, this little video clip shows her collapsing on stage moments after, I mean just immediately after she made a joke about Jesus. In my estimation, it was a blasphemous joke about Jesus. And she collapsed on the stage and literally cracked her skull. This happened three weeks ago. This was at Tempe Improv here in, in our town, in our city. And um, uh, she had to go to the hospital. But uh, the thing, and, and by the way, when I show this video in just a second, I want you to keep in mind that this, it's jolting. I mean, it's harsh. It's, it is, um, be ready because it makes you go, oh man, that really happened. And it actually breaks my heart for her. But the reason I show it is not to poke at her or to uh, make fun of her, but instead to show you the after effect. And the after effect is that she was interviewed uh, about it and the reporter says to her, I, and by the way, she's, the interview is just laced with F-bombs. She's just dropping them left and right. And the interviewer says, I feel like if Jesus flipped you over, he would have given you a softer landing. He wouldn't have been that mad at you. And Heather says, I know, it's not Jesus, you guys. Jesus thinks I'm a hoot. Here's Heather McDonald. I think the most dangerous thing in the world is to have this view of Jesus as being my warm, nice, peaceful, happy friend without there being any sense of us having a responsibility to Him. I think it's a very dangerous place Amen. for us as a nation. So, I want to share with you, here's the conversation that you need to have with your friend. Friend, I want to be honest with you. I'm pretty concerned about how our culture is going right now because there's this really wrong teaching that's out there and it, it sort of says that Jesus, he's, he's just a softy. You know, Jesus, he wants everyone to feel good and, and so... When, when Jesus encounters you, he's, he's, never, he's never going to say anything to offend you. And, and Jesus is always going to make you feel warm and loved and good fuzzy feelings. And, and that's the main thing. Just feel loved. Just, just relax. Just enjoy life. Because you see, the danger of that teaching is that if we're not careful, we can take Jesus... And just treat him like we do a lot of other objects. We'll, we'll just put him in that one drawer. You know the drawer we all have. Just the drawer where we don't know quite what to do with things. And we're going to use them someday. So we just throw Jesus in the drawer. Hey, Jesus, you loved me. Boy, that's so nice. Thanks. And, and you put him away in the drawer. By the way, uh, there's lots of different roads to get to God. There are all different paths. You know, lots of different gods. It doesn't matter which road you take. Just switch, take whichever one you want. And we just shove him in a drawer and put them aside. But you see, the Bible uses this thing called the Ten Commandments. And if the Ten Commandments are really what we're going to be judged by, then we're probably in a lot of trouble. Because most of us have lied. We probably have told a lie. Now, even if it was just a white lie. Most of us most of us have stolen something at some point in our life, even if it was just a little tiny object, but it wasn't ours, and we took it and we stole it. In fact, most of us have had thoughts about adultery. Most of us have coveted after things that don't belong to us, and, and we really shouldn't want them. And so you see, if God judges us by the Ten Commandments, we're in real trouble because... 
We are nothing but a bunch of lying thieves who have committed adultery in our hearts and longed for things in our minds that we shouldn't have. But here's what Jesus' love is really like. Jesus' love is as if you were convicted of a crime and they sentenced you to death. And you had to stand before a judge. And as you stand before the judge and he's ready to read the verdict and you know they've got you dead to rights, you are guilty and they're going to sentence you to death. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes in and he says, Your Honor, could I have a word? I would like to take his place. You see, because I lived a pure and sinless life, I never committed a sin. I never committed a wrong. And I gave my life. I was crucified. I received the death sentence. So, Your Honor, the death sentence that you want to give to Him, I'm asking, would you let my death sentence cover that and let Him go free? You see, friend, that kind of love, it's more than just something gushy and warm, fuzzy feeling. That kind of love where He would be willing to give His own life for us, that kind of love deserves a response. And that response should be, Jesus, yes, thank you for taking my place on the cross. And yes, I receive your love. And yes, Lord, become my master. That's the conversation that we need to have with our friends. Amen. The, the truth is, that many people around us, they've never really been told that. They just hear that God is love, Jesus is love, and they don't really wrestle with it. But that's the conversation that we need to have. And what do I base that on? I base it upon an event that happened in the Bible, Mark chapter 10, where Jesus encounters a rich young ruler. And he has some questions and Jesus gives him some answers and it leaves the disciples going, oh my goodness, if that's the way it is, nobody's ever going to be saved. There's no hope for any of us. Let's read it together. Mark 10, as Jesus started on his way, verse 17, a man ran up to meet him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. By the way, just like you and me, always wanting to know what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? We can't do anything. All we can do is accept what He has already done. That's what we can do. So why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one's good except God alone. You know the commandments you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Notice, look, this is really important. Notice that Jesus pointed him to the Ten Commandments. He says, all of the commandments you know. Uh, no murder, no blasphemy, no stealing, no adultery, no lying, no defrauding. Honor your father and mother. And there's two things I want to bring out this morning, and this is the first one. Number one, point your friend to a higher standard. Point your friend to a higher standard. Let your friend know there's a higher expectation than what you've been told. Everybody's telling you God is love and, and God loves you. And yes, He does. And that love is unrelenting. It pursues us. It will never stop chasing us down. But it requires a response. Amen. And so, um, look at verse 20. Teacher, He declared, 
All these things I have kept since I was a boy. Now, <laughs> really, did he really keep all these things since he was a boy? I mean, Jesus could have really, you know, he could have nailed him on this if he wanted to. Really? You think you've kept all of these things since you were a boy, do you? In, in fact, Jesus may have actually nailed him. It seems like Jesus focused in on commandment number 10, to not covet. It, it appears that this rich young ruler was a hoarder of all things nice. If, if it was gold and flashy and shiny, he wanted to accumulate it. He wanted to gather it. His belief system was, he who dies at the end with the most toys wins. <laughs> Kind of reminds me of a bumper sticker I saw one time that said, He who dies with the most toys still dies. Or like um, one comedian one time that I heard who said, You know, the only problem with the rat race is you're still a rat. <laughs> so there, there's more. There's more to just then just God loves me. But there's this response and this higher standard. So look at verse 21. Jesus, who knows Him better than anyone, He really does bring His attention to this area. Jesus loved, looked at Him and loved Him. Let those words sink in. Jesus looked at this young man and loved Him. He loved Him. One thing you lack, He said, go Sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Notice that just how it was that Jesus demonstrated this love. It says that Jesus loved him. It wasn't, oh, bless your heart, warm, gushy feelings. No. Jesus calls for a radical commitment. Go sell everything you have and then come and follow me. Jesus looked at him and loved him by saying, go sell it all. In other words, detach from every other thing. It's a radical commitment. And that is the second thing that I want to bring out. Call for a radical commitment from your friend. Don't, don't just leave them, let them off easy. Tell them, look, you know, if you want to serve God, it's a serious deal. It, it means a radical commitment to follow Jesus. So Jesus said, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. Do you know, those are the same words that Jesus spoke to Andrew, to Thomas, to Peter to John, to James, the exact same words. Come, follow me. This rich young man, he could have been the 13th disciple. He, we don't know. He could have written the fifth gospel. The very words that Jesus spoke to the others, he invites him in, but he wasn't willing he wasn't brave enough. And so look at verse 22. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children... <laughs> How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone else who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is for the rich. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus, you're never going to grow a church that way. Don't you know you're offensive when you teach people that way? You're going to just drive them away. Jesus, you're going about it all wrong. You better be careful, Jesus. You're going to run people off. You'll never be able to draw a crowd that way. 
Look at verse 26. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Can you imagine being the disciples? I picture myself being there. What Jesus just told this young man. And now, <clears throat> pardon me. Now he says, it's, it's nearly impossible. It's, it's like trying to squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle. And some historians have dated that back to the middle, uh, middle Ages when they had gates that were large, but they had a doorway called a needle. And uh, sometimes the, the camel could go through the needle, uh, but in order to do so, it had to bend down and unload all the cargo, and then it could fit through. And I think, boy, that's a beautiful picture, but it's not accurate. It's a real problem because that didn't happen for 1,300 years after Jesus. Jesus is very clear. What he's describing is something that's impossible. This is impossible. And the disciples are going, this is just impossible. Who could ever be saved? And so verse 26, it says the disciples said to each other, who then can be saved? In other words, we're doomed. <laughs> There's no hope for us. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. Everybody say, Not with God. God. You've all heard that phrase, but God, right? Say it with me, but God. All things are possible with God. And then Peter spoke up. Now, Peter notoriously put his foot in his mouth, right? But didn't Peter also say some great things? I mean, wasn't he a remarkable disciple? And here, listen, this context requires you have to listen to the intonation of my voice or you'll miss it. They've just watched Jesus tell this young man, give it all away and come and follow me. And he turns away sad. He walks away. And, and they're all just so sad. None of us are going to be able to be saved. And God, Jesus says, all things are possible with God. And then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Do you hear the difference? We, we Sometimes we read that, we have left everything to follow you. But Peter is responding to what he just saw. Hey, Jesus, we did do that. We left everything to follow you. I mean, what about us? Peter could have been saying, you know, I, I don't have the kind of cash that that guy had. Man, did you see his uh, Armani suit and the beautiful Italian shoes and that late model camel he's riding. I mean, that guy, he, boy, he's well off. But hey, Jesus, I mean, I did leave the family business to follow you. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge success, but I was guaranteed my dad was a fisherman and, and me and Andrew, we were going to inherit the business and, and we walked away from it to follow you. Radical abandonment. This is loving Jesus with reckless abandon. It's just saying, Lord, anything you ask of me, I'm willing, I will give it, I will lay it down. This is what the kind of love that Jesus is describing is all about. It's not gushy and easy and warm. It's demanding and radical. That's the balance that we have to bring to our testimony. And so, in light of all of this, I ask you, what's the big idea? Look at your neighbor and say, what's the big idea? That's just my way of saying, if there's one thing that I'd like you to take away from this teaching today, one thing that you could carry with you throughout this week, this would be it. There is a huge payoff. There is a massive reward 
for the ones who lay it all down and follow Jesus. It's a huge payoff. Amen. Remind your friend that it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it to lay down everything and follow Jesus. Because look at these very next words. It's verse 29. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel. No one who has left those things will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and children, and fields, children. That's a new word. That's the plural of plural, okay? That comes to you from the Department of Redundancy Department. <laughs> children and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the and the last will be first. Fade to black, that's the end of the story. I want to ask our, our team to come. Pastor Mo's going to lead us in a response of worship. I, I remember that there was a time in my ministry where I looked back over that list and I wasn't bragging. Actually, I was pretty low. I, I was pretty low. I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty high right now. I mean, I'm really. Man, I'm so excited about all the things God's doing in our lives. And, but after serving God for many years, I had, I was pretty low. And one day I said, Lord, that list. I've I've done that. I, on some level, I left fields. I left houses. I left mother. My mom's in the hospital today in Texas. That's not easy. I left brothers, sisters-in-law. Left that to follow you. Even children. I would never abandon my kids. I love my kids more than life itself. And yet now I find a distance. One son in prison. He's four hours away. We visit him every chance we get. He loves God with all his heart. Amen. One son in the Air Force with world events shaping up that concern a dad and mom. But I'm going to tell you, God in that moment said to me, I'm just so proud of you, my son. And haven't I always taken care of you? And don't you trust that I always will take care of you? And don't you remember the miracles that have taken place every step along the way? How I always, always come in at just the right time. I never, I never let you down. I will never fail you. God will never fail you. No matter what you're facing, it's going to be worth it all. A hundred times over, guaranteed, if not in this life, in the life to come. To the ones who have the obedience of the disciples, they're going to stand before God and He's going to say, hey, look, everybody look at this. This is my faithful one. You today get what you deserve. Woo! And it's just going to pour out blessings on you so enormous that the crowd is going to gasp in amazement. So first, first if you're here today and you're not in a, a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to give you the chance to do that right now. You might be here in this room. You might be watching online. If you need relationship with the life giver Jesus, I want to give you the chance right now. And I would ask that if you pray this prayer silently in your heart today, 
Then after church is over, you can send me an email even if you're watching online. But if you're here in this room, please come up to me or someone that you perceive to be a leader and tell them that you prayed that prayer with Pastor Keith today. And here's the prayer. Lord, I accept your love with no strings attached, no holes barred, no conditions upon it. I am going to walk in relationship with you. I respond to that kind of love. God, if you were willing to do that for me, that really gets my attention. And so right now, I respond by asking you to come live in my heart, wash away my sins, make me a new creature from this moment forward. I really mean this. You are my master and my Lord. For I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, please tell me or tell another. Please, it's important. We want to get you some good steps right out the chute to make sure that you are strong in your walk with the Lord. And welcome to the kingdom of God. And then, for the rest of you, this is what the Lord put on my heart. That if any of you would like to have prayer this morning, I would count it an honor. If you just need your pastor to lay hands on you and anoint you with oil and pray over you that you're going to be just fine, that it's going to be worth it all, and that you're going to make it okay. If you need refreshing, if you need a touch, if you just need a, a new boost, a, a new uplift, then as the team leads us, I'm going to make my way right down here and I would love to pray with you. And if there's several of you who want to come, you're welcome to. Prayer team members will come. There will be enough people to pray one-on-one -on -one with each one of you. But you're going to make it. You're going to make it just fine because God loves you and He's on your side. Let's all stand to our feet and sing and worship.